Hi, this is Bill Springer, senior editor of Cruising World Magazine. And uh, I got an interesting email recently from an astronaut who was actually up on the International Space Station. Turns out uh, Mike Barrett is an avid cruiser and an avid Cruising World reader. And I thought this would be a great opportunity to uh, ask him some questions. Uh, and the first question I wanted to ask him was, is traveling in space the ultimate offshore passage? Right now, we're traveling around in low Earth orbit, and we're separated from the Earth, but mostly by speed, not so much by distance. We're only about 220 nautical miles above the surface of the Earth. But of course, we're traveling very fast to maintain that orbit, and that's what the rocket ride does to it. It's kind of like being at anchor, in some ways, or loitering offshore. In addition, uh, we're very connected to our home, unlike an offshore passage. The ISS is very much a working laboratory, and we depend on broadband communications for data transfer and video transfer. But along with that, we have very liberal radio contact. We even have an internet protocol telephone that we can use to call home and call anybody we want, essentially. And uh, we can uh, do email very liberally. So we're perhaps a little bit more connected to home than you would be during an offshore passage. And again, sort of like loitering offshore. Now, if you were to break orbit and start heading to Mars, that would be the ultimate offshore passage. Wow, I, I hadn't thought of that. Now, we haven't sent humans to Mars yet, so there's really no cruising guide for that destination. It would be much more like the early European voyages to the America. We don't know much about it, but it's certainly a place that we want to explore. It's a very long way, and that, I think, is the ultimate offshore passage. Uh, so, Mike, uh, my next question would be, is the bunk on, your, on the space station anything like your bunk on the boat? Well, there's a couple of differences, uh, one of which is that you expect a rhythmic motion when you're at anchor or during a passage, and you kind of sense that motion, and eventually it lulls you to sleep. And anything out of the ordinary might even wake you up. Up here, there's no motion whatsoever. And the other thing is that you just float up here, and you tie your sleeping bag down just to keep it from floating away. But there's no pressure on the bed, there's no pressure on the surface. There's a lot of difference from just spreading out onto a bunk. But I can tell you that it's small, it's cozy, it's personal and it looks very, very good at the end of a long, hard working day. We have our sleeping bag here that looks like it's standing up. Let me hop into it, just as I would every night. And of course, uh, there's really no up or down here. Up or down is what we choose to decide at our convenience. So I could have this uh, upside down from what you're looking at, but right now it looks like I'm standing up. There we go. I can tell you that we sleep very, very well up here, and we're always happy to get our rack time. Good night. What are the similarities between space travel and actually doing an offshore passage on your boat? Launching to orbit is more like crossing a dangerous bar to get to the open sea than it is like an offshore passage, per se. Similar to uh, timing your departure on the, uh, on the tides and the currents, you have to pretty much get whack on your time for launch so that you can rendezvous with the target that you intend to, in this case, the International Space Station. It all happens pretty quickly. It's about an eight and a half minute rocket ride to orbit. There's a lot of noise, a lot of vibration, and things are pretty exciting as you uh, cross that bar. But once the engine's cut off, everything settles down quite a bit, and you're coasting. And it's very much like loitering offshore in a more predictable seaway. So uh, at that point, uh, things are uh, very peaceful. You'd have to make just occasional course corrections, and things become much more leisurely than the launch. So Mike, is being on the space station kind of like being on a boat at anchor? In my experience, when you really keep your attentions directed towards the inside, the space station is exactly like being on a boat at anchor. You get used to a certain feel of the space station, the sight, the sounds, the smells, the rhythm. And anything outside of that uh, gets your attention and you want to go check it. it. even can wake you up at night, a very strange right. uh, sound or anything that's a little bit out of that background ordinary that you normally sense. There is one difference, and that is that uh, even though we're in this stable parking orbit like a boat would be in a harbor, uh, we are in orbit, which means we're traveling fairly fast. We circumnavigate the globe 16 times a day. So that's pretty fast. And you get that sensation only when you look outside. Otherwise, you don't perceive it. And we never tire of watching the Earth go by. When we get a chance to look out the window to watch the oceans and the continents, or during a night pass, watching the stars go by above the atmosphere, they're absolutely brilliant. That's just an amazing thing to see. Now, there is uh, one little thing that's similar to an offshore passage, perhaps, and that is the risk of colliding with something floating. It's a very big sky, just like it's a very big ocean, and the risk of that encounter is fairly small. 
However, there is a possibility that an incoming micrometeorite, or more likely a piece of orbital debris as we call it, otherwise known as space junk, some piece part from an old rocket, might actually get in front of your course here. And at 17,500 miles per hour, that could really ruin your day. Fortunately, anything bigger than about uh, four inches or so, we can track by ground radars and we can do debris avoidance maneuvers, essentially steering out of the way before we get close to it if we need to. So again, we haven't had any trouble. Big sky, big ocean, flotsam and jetsam, same concept. Are some of the situations that come up when you're on your boat offshore similar to what comes up when you're on the space station? The answer to that is absolutely yes. Uh, first of all, your ship is only as good as your crew, pretty much in any circumstance. And then second, to just imagine taking some of your even closest friends and co-workers and uh, being locked in your garage or say a small house with them for six months at a time. Obviously, everybody has to get along very well. In our case, we trained together for a few years before coming together to uh, meet up on the International Space Station. Part of that training, aside from slogging through classroom and simulators, also includes survival training, sea landing situations, cold weather, and even underwater habitat. So by the time we get up here, we've known each other for quite a while and we know each other's habits and we know how to work together very well. We have to have some social time and ours tends to be centered around the galley table. And every night we meet for dinner. We tend to prolong that a little bit for maybe an hour to an hour and a half. And it's a great wardroom experience. A galley table experience means swapping sea stories, talking about the day, solving the world's problems on a nightly visit. It's always been my fantasy to invite somebody up to dinner here around our galley table and share that time with us. It's a great time. But otherwise, it's very much like being on a boat. You have to be very self-sufficient, both physically and uh, socially. And of course, your neck, your safety can depend on how well your shipmates perform. So there's quite a bit of incentive to know your job and do it well and to communicate well. Get along and play well with others, if you will. So Mike, what's more fun, cruising in space or cruising offshore in your own boat? Well, I love my boat and I love this space station. And I can tell you that uh, when I'm out cruising or uh, just anywhere out on a boat and I look up and sometimes I wish I were flying or I wish I were in space. And sometimes when I'm up here, I look down at these beautiful tropical islands or the fjords around uh, Patagonia, for instance, or the inside passage of British Columbia. And I wish I were down there on my boat. So I guess each venue has its allure. Both are just incredibly beautiful and wonderful experiences. But this is my day job, and I doubt that I'll get anything equivalent that lets me spend uh, so much time like this on my boat. So I think uh, traveling in space right now is just a great thing for me. Another great question, uh, a personal question, do you navigate by the stars when you cruise on your boat at home? Well, unfortunately the answer is no. I pretty much use GPS like everybody else. Instead, I just like to admire the stars and marvel at them. And I do the same thing up here. Whenever I get a chance and find a dark window and get dark adapted, I just love to look at the stars and find the constellations I know. What do you do in your leisure time? Well, there's precious little leisure time up here. We work pretty hard and there's always stuff to do to kind of make your ship better. We were talking about coiling lines and coiling wires over here and just uh, making sure things are stowed and keeping this as a good ship-shaped laboratory to work in. But uh, there are a couple of other things we do to kind of uh, relieve stress and uh, to take our minds off of our work once in a while. We do have movies up here. We can watch those uh, while we exercise. We have books. We have electronic books. We have email. And uh, we do exercise, by the way, about two and a half hours a day, and that's to ward off the effects of zero gravity on our bones and muscles, which otherwise tend to kind of weaken in zero gravity. So exercise for us is more than just a stress reliever. It's like sucking on limes to uh, prevent scurvy, very much so. It doesn't always seem pleasant, but uh, once you're doing it, it's actually not so bad. The other thing we really love to do is just look out the windows and take pictures whenever we get a chance. If you look here, this is a, a picture of a hurricane, much more comfortable to view it from where we see it than uh, where you might see it down in the ocean. This is Hurricane Felicia. And uh, we've taken probably upwards of uh, 28,000 to 30,000 pictures uh, since I've been up here in this last uh, six and a half month period. But we never tire of looking out the window. You can't imagine how beautiful the earth is. And we've just seen some beautiful tropical islands. And something else that uh, one of my office mates, Don Pettit, very eloquently describes as orbital scrimshaw are just personal projects that we might bring along. This is the uh, Good Ship Endeavor. Some of you may uh, recognize, and as you can see, that uh, even after about six months or so, it's still not quite complete. So what about when you go to the bathroom? Do you have to pump the head? And Well, it's kind of the other way around. 
as I'll show you, it pumps you. Up here, you gotta remember that there's no gravity, so nothing falls anywhere. In fact, the only thing that makes fluid go a certain direction is airflow. So, if you wanna pee, you take your pee hose, turn on the fan, which is actually a suction, and there we have good flow. So uh, it takes the fluid that you pee into it, pumps it down through a hose, and some of you may know that eventually we reclaim that water and recycle it. Yes, that means it becomes tomorrow's coffee. To do anything more substantial, well, use your imagination. It's all about airflow again, and just think, uh, like being at sea, alignment is everything. <laughs> so be very careful and develop your technique. What's the most exotic meal you've eaten in space? Well, I want to show you, first of all, the galley table that I mentioned earlier. This is where the crew of the International Space Station meets for dinner. We swap sea stories. We solve the world's problems on a nightly basis. We bring a lot of countries and a lot of opinions together, and we just have a great time. Now, some of the food that we get to eat may look very familiar. Tortillas, which are wonderful at sea and wonderful in zero gravity. And uh, we have basic... Uh, chicken salad spread, things that you'd recommend or uh, recognize, old standbys, always good aboard ship. And then we have some more international foods because we are an international crew. This for instance is uh, Japanese seaweed soup, which is open. And um, European uh, fine French cuisine, this is a vegetable pate. We have a lobster pate here. And the food is just absolutely wonderful. But I think uh, you've already seen that the exotic aspect of this food up here is not so much what the food actually is. You've heard the old adage, location, location, location. Up here, everything floats. Now, you've all uh, probably been in a seaway and have uh, everything from food to uh, instruments to everything just kind of fly off the table. But they always tend to end up in a build somewhere. Well, here, everything just floats, so we try to keep everything strapped down, velcroed down, taped down, somehow down everywhere we can. So this is one aspect of our food up here, which I would say makes everything taste a little bit better. And uh, the other aspect is we can play with our food up here. And uh, not that we're totally serious all the time, but uh, small things that we can pop into our mouths, uh, we, we just love to do that. And especially if there's somebody that uh, needs some help getting the food into their mouths, uh, it's just a wonderful thing to have somebody throw you a cracker or something like that. So. Uh, Eventually. One of my uh, shipmates is uh, rapidly preparing me a cracker, and let's see how good she is. Here it comes, here it comes, wait for it. Oh, Another one coming right oh. out <laughs> Maybe a cracker could be really exotic in space. Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. This has been so cool.